Hello, I'm Daniel Prusilides. Welcome to The Long Way, a podcast of short episodes with long perspectives on building the common good. Welcome to Season 2 of The Long Way, this being our first episode of this season. I am just thrilled to be back. The Long Way is a podcast of think tank Cardis, based in Hamilton, Ontario. And what does Cardis do? We develop public policies, habits, and arguments to help us all live well together, honor our differences, and protect the vulnerable. Now, that's all wrapped up in the concept of the common good, something we explore in all its dimensions on The Long Way. Now, just before I introduce our featured guest, let me also note that if you've got some thoughts or reactions to share on this or any other episode of The Long Way, don't be shy to write to us at media at cardus.ca, cardus, C-A-R-D-U-S. Well, have you ever considered what religion is worth to society? There are many ways to answer that question, but one is to look at the economic value of religion. Cardis has just published a fascinating new report called The Hidden Economy, How Faith Helps Fuel Canada's GDP. So I'd like to welcome to The Long Way a co-author of that study, Dr. Brian Grimm. He is the founder and president of the Religious Freedom and Business Foundation, and he's a leading expert on the socioeconomic impacts of restrictions on religious freedom. Dr. Grimm, it's great to have you on The Long Way. Great to be with you, Daniel. So let's start by unpacking the findings uh, a little bit from this newly published report, um, which we've, we've called The Hidden Economy, How Faith Helps Fuel Canada's GDP. There is a the mid-range estimate in the report of a $67.5 billion annual contribution from religion generally, religious activity, religious uh, organizations, religious uh, people, to uh, Canadian society, to, to, to Canada's economy. Can you unpack that $67.5 billion figure? What, what goes into producing that? It's uh, one of the greatest untold stories about religion. And um, some may think it a, a little bit strange to try, to try to quantify the impact of faith uh, to a society. But uh, if you think of uh, things such as love, you know, w- w- how can you quantify love? But, uh, you know, my daughter a couple years ago got married uh, in, in Center City, Baltimore, and I can tell you exactly how much uh, love brought into the city, you know, when that wedding happened. So, uh, there are sort of economic things associated with with uh, some of the most uh, personal and um, profound things that we do. So this study tried to um, look at that for Canadian society, and um, uh, by seeing the both the actual economic activity of faith groups as well as the fair market value of the services that they provide. So at the at the very fundamental level, uh, all Charities and faith-based groups um, and religious groups, congregations uh, in Canada make a report of what their revenues and expenses are. So that that was really our beginning point. Um, and and uh, when you think of what a, a, a local congregation, whether it's a church or a mosque or a synagogue or a temple or some other uh, religious uh, place of activity, uh, when you look at their revenue, what does that revenue represent it it usually represents uh, jobs uh, people that they're employing uh, either as clergy or as support staff Um, it represents uh, buildings that they've built uh, and that is all part of a local economy you have a building then you're going to have to plow the snow in the summer and keep the heat running and uh, turn the lights on when it's dark and all of those economic activities are benefiting uh, the local community. So that's that's sort of the beginning point. But then if you look at what they do, um, just taking, you know, one example, you know, across Canada, um, many, many places of worship uh, host uh, recovery groups for people <clears throat> recovering from uh, various forms of addiction, either drug or alcohol. And if you uh, take that and, and estimate 
what that value is in terms of saved lives, you know, it's just millions and millions of dollars of, of value when you uh, put it in those terms. So this value is uh, both in the actual economic activity, but in other things such as uh, I mentioned my daughter getting married. So uh, a faith congregation is sort of a magnet uh, to have weddings or other kinds of uh, activities. A lot of places of worship have lectures or uh, even health clinics or food banks and all of these kinds of activities um, bring economic activity often to the places that need it the most, um, you know, a downtown area uh, or uh, a remote area that uh, is um, you know, rural and uh, it forms a, a hub for community activity. So the estimate took all these different types of activities into effect is something we call the halo effect sort of the the larger um uh, the larger set of values that come from uh, from the activities of faith-based organizations in the community the, the halo effect i mean that is an interesting phenomenon in and of itself and it's something that cardis has studied uh a, a fair bit uh in the past in fact we've got a a website called the Halo Pro, HaloProject.ca, HaloProject.ca, where folks can go and look at, you know, they can plug in their own community, their own uh, city or town in Canada, and get that city's estimated halo effect based on what the uh, revenues are of a, of a religious congregation. And that's all based on data that we have from uh, Canada Revenue Agency. Uh but but the, but the halo effect basically measures, as I've understood it, the the I guess the multiplier effect of a religious congregation's budget, and that budget doesn't just affect that congregation; it affects the wider community. With all of the examples that you've given, uh, everywhere from promoting health and well-being, uh, decreasing drug and alcohol abuse, or or divorce, or domestic violence, all those sorts of things, providing daycare services, uh, day camps, um, yeah, there's the magnet effect from from weddings, funerals, those so those other events, but you know, supporting immigrants and refugees, uh, uh, food banks, housing support, uh, even recreational possibilities. One really interesting aspect, and you mentioned alcohol abuse programs, one interesting aspect I found from the report that you uh, authored is that uh, on average in Canada, about half of Alcoholics Anonymous or Celebrate Recovery programs actually meet in churches or other uh, religious buildings in Canada, and that actually gusts up to 71% uh, in the greater Toronto area. That's a that's a remarkable uh, concentration of some very positive activity happening within Canadian religious buildings that doesn't affect just that religious congregation. Well, that's right. I, I think when people think of a religious congregation, they think of it sort of like a club. You know, it's a place where the people who are Methodist or Baptist or Muslim or whatever the faith is come together and they do things, you know, together. They worship, they, you know, have activities that benefit um, the, the members, but actually faith groups exist uh, for a much larger purpose. They're, they have a mission to, um, uh, in the Christian term, be salt and light in the world. Uh, so it's, they're, they're trying to bring flavor, they're trying to give hope, they're trying to give values. And so therefore much of the programming that congregations have is, is outward focused. So I think the, the recovery groups are just such an excellent example of that when you have um, you know, one out of two congregations hosting this, one that points to the need. There's, you know, there's a tremendous need um, in modern society for um, <clears throat> people for psychological care, for care with, when they're facing problems that lead to addiction. And uh, it's just uh, amazing that congregations have stepped up uh, and responded to that need. And if it weren't for them uh, charging you know, no rent or very, very low rent uh, for different groups, uh, these groups wouldn't have anywhere to go. So uh, there's you know, a study looking at you know, if, if, if they didn't have these places of worship that are offering their space, um, then where would they go? And, and most of them say, we don't know. You know, this is, this, is the, this is the place where we can really carry out these services for others. Yeah, that, of course, raises the question of what 
what the cost is to Canadian society generally, religious or not, um, of faith buildings shutting down in Canada, because we have seen that that phenomenon. Uh, and uh, according to some media reports, it's a, it's a growing phenomenon. I mean, I know some congregations are growing, other congregations are shrinking, but when church buildings close, uh, or other religious buildings close, it doesn't affect just that congregation. Well, that's, that's right. There's research showing that when a faith congregation closes within 10 years after they close, that, uh, that whole neighborhood will go into economic um, despair and distress. So the, what, there's different reasons a congregation would close. One is if they're in an inner city and all the congregants have sort of moved out to the suburbs, um, maybe that church will ro- or congregation will locate uh, somewhere else, or it's just dwindling membership, uh, whatever the reason. But what comes in to replace that, that congregation and that church uh, when the church was there, a congregation was there, there was all kinds of different kinds of activity that we've talked about. When it's gone, um, you know, then maybe a liquor store moves in, maybe, you know, whatever might take that place. And then instead of being a center for um, community enrichment, it, it becomes just another business uh, and is not, a, not such an attractive force. So you can, you can imagine uh, you know, the community decline when you start missing core social institutions like a, con- a you know, faith congregation uh, that's been there as, a, um, as a, a, a definer of that community goes missing, and then the community is uh, much poorer for it. Would you say, then, that there is a connection between um, religious freedom and economic growth uh, because we you know we, we've talked about sort of the economic uh, and social impact of religious congregations but those religious congregations they can't operate if, if there isn't religious freedom they need to be able to express their beliefs publicly um, in their in their activities in, in order for all that um, for, for all that benefit to happen so how do you see that that connection between religious freedom and, say, uh, economic growth? Well, uh, yeah, we've done a separate study on that, a separate uh, series of studies looking at the connection between religious freedom in countries and and across the world. And where you have more religious freedom, the data are clear, you have uh, a more innovative society with uh, pillars for sustainable development um, being strong. So So those pillars for economic uh, global development uh, include support for the rule of law, sort of ethical basis, uh, strong foundations that support society uh, outside of just what the economics of a business. So when, when you look at what drives um, sort of the economies of countries, uh, it's more than just uh, what gets manufactured or the services provided. It's, it's, it's the institutions that provide a safe and peaceful uh, place for um, uh, for economic growth to occur. So that's one of the greatest benefits that we see in the data of religious freedom is that when people uh, are free to practice their faith, have a faith, change their faith, or have no faith at all, and they um, the governments protect that, the, that right, and people in society res- give each other that freedom, uh, even if you, you know, it doesn't mean you have to agree with your neighbors, uh, all the beliefs of your neighbor, but you give the, your neighbor that freedom, uh, then people work together better. Instead of uh, religion becoming a source of tension or uh, conflict, uh, it becomes something that uh, brings societies together. And, and that's really, you could say, good for business. You know, in, in recent years, we've seen courts... Uh, and governments in Canada take, I think, what some people would call a dismissive attitude toward uh, people of of all faiths. Um, You know, and there's been concerns over church closures amid uh, COVID-19. There's been a, you know, a court decision regarding Trinity Western University, uh, even uh, denial of of job creation funds uh, based on um, 
re- religious beliefs or, or expression uh, at some level. Uh, and some some Canadian faithful sense an active disregard for religious freedom. So what language would they use uh, or or what actions would they take to get authorities to recognize the asset that religious freedom is? Well, um, maybe I'll just share an anecdote. Uh, a few years ago, I was um, at Davos, uh, the World Economic Annuals Meeting, and uh, it was soon after the election of Justin Trudeau as, as prime minister. And um, he had he invited several of us to come together and have a dialogue with him about civil society, including faith-based society, uh, faith-based groups in society, and what he was hoping for his national agenda. And one of the things that he mentioned was, you know, he's, you know, uh, you know, he grew up with a faith, but, it, you know, it's, it's, it's not something that's a day-to-day uh, activity that he's doing. So I think for people that are not uh, particularly religious, you know, that, or even if they've moved away from religion, uh, it, they just don't see the see what faith has to offer. And I think that that's what one of the unique contribution of this study is that it puts it in a different framework for people who don't have a connection to faith or aren't active in faith. Uh, but says, oh, I never thought of that, that, you know, there, the, that this is actually something that's valuable for our society. So I think all of that is very important as you um, address issues that can make society more religiously free or more open to religious expression and religious activity or policies that don't. And I think if uh, policymakers understand that this is not just a feel good activity or it's not just a. Um, you know, a nice thing for for those for those religious groups, but it's something that's a powerful force for good for all of society, even those people who don't belong to faith. I think that can help uh, people better understand why religious freedom is important for society. I think one of the other aspects is religious freedom, um, as, as actually you've you've written that religious freedom correlates to uh, the presence of other. Uh, fundamental freedoms, like, you know, freedom of the press, for example. Um, how does that add up, though, when when people of faith uh, or faith itself is seen kind of as an as an outlier or, at least in Canadian society, less relevant than it used to be? Well, I think that one of the things that um, research shows is that where you have, just like you mentioned, where you have um, guard one human right. So religious freedom um, is a universally accepted right. Uh, Article 18 of the U- uh, Universal Declaration of Human Rights um, uh, guards that freedom of uh, conscience, belief, uh, worship is a right of individuals and communities. Um, so what we find is when you ha- guard that right, other rights that people care about, like women's uh, rights, or racial um, racial equality, racial justice, uh, even LGBTQ rights, all of these kinds of other uh, concerns for different uh, uh, groups of people rise together. So a, a, a study that many found surprising that we did found that where you uh, have more religious freedom, you have more um, acceptance of LGBT people. And where you have less religious freedom, you have less acceptance. Uh, so that some so some of the objections people have to religion and uh, guarding religious freedom, they they throw up that well, if we guard that, then it's going to hurt the, these other people, uh, or it's going to um, discriminate discriminate against people who aren't religious. But actually, the opposite is, is the effect that when you guard um, human rights for one group of people. Uh, that coincides with uh, a sort of rising human rights standards uh, for all classes of people. Absolutely fascinating. We could go on for, for hours and hours, but we'll have to end it there. Uh, Dr. Brian Grimm, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, this brings us to the end of this episode of The Long Way, the first of season two. And just before we go, let's connect with producer Rachel Fedema, used to be DeBrun. Till a wedding happened this summer, so congratulations. 
Thank you. No wedding like a pandemic wedding. <laughs> yeah, well, nice to hear from uh, Brian Grimm that your wedding had an economic benefit, pandemic or not. Yeah, I'm glad to hear that too. Just it's for the better good. <laughs> it's for the greater good, for the common good. Uh, you know, uh, if someone wanted to know more about the hidden economy, where would they go? They can go right over to our website, cardis.ca. We'll be uh, highlighting it in the next weeks. But if you ever just go to our research tab, it's right in there. Excellent. And also, anyone who wants to learn a little bit more about uh, the halo effect, uh, I would visit haloproject.ca for that aspect of our research. In fact, we've just redone that website, haloproject.ca, well worth visiting. Uh, You can expect, by the way, the next episode of The Long Way in uh, about two weeks, Rachel? Yeah, can count on it. Okay. And uh, you know what? It, why leave it to chance uh, to, to remember to get that next episode? So subscribe or follow or like The Long Way wherever you're getting this podcast so that you won't miss it. Thanks for listening. Uh, for Rachel Fedema and the entire Cardis team, I'm Daniel Prusilides.